so welcome as we have part two with Ben Conley and talking about discipleship and today talking about discipleship in community. And so I just wanted to give a plug for Ben's book. Um, and it's a field guide for genuine community. Um, and it's, uh, you know, pertaining to disciple making discipleship. And uh, Ben has written some other field guides for some other things as well. So he's an author, but he's also a presenter and a teacher. Um, most recently with Saturate as a trainer and teacher for Saturate. And now uh, Ben is starting a brand new nonprofit um, and it's gonna be called the Equipping Group. And we'll be doing a lot of the same kinds of things that you see him do. Um, he's done some lead one events for us, one day leadership training events. And we'll be doing another one of those in um, South Texas with the Lamb District, uh, the first Saturday in October. So mm -hmm. I appreciate Ben being a part of that. So Ben's married to Jessica. They have three kids, lives in the Fort Worth area. And uh, so who do you root for there? What's the college team, Ben, that you follow? Yeah, well, those are two different questions. So the college team here is TCU. Uh, yeah. who, we, who we root for though would be Baylor. So. Uh, okay. Well, they won this last weekend. I was going to say we had a good go Bears. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was a good weekend for Baylor. <laughs> ben, did you graduate from Baylor? I did, yeah. Sweet. Uh, I got my MDiv at Truett. Oh, nice. Very cool, Tim. So we'll kind of do it the way we did last time. If you, uh, Ben's going to present a little bit, and then we want to open it up for more interaction. So if you have questions, you can put those in the chat or when it comes time to asking questions and we'll have you raise your hand or, or whatever. Uh, but as you have things you might be thinking about as he's presenting, you put that in the chat, he might be able to respond to that as he's starting. So Ben, we're gonna turn it over to you, Ben Conley, appreciate you being here and uh, you know, blessings as you teach and, and lead us, thanks. All right. Well, for the second week in a row, uh, I get to say that it is my honor to be joining you. And uh, for those who weren't here last week, um, or gosh, it's just been seven full days for all of us. So I'll give a little bit of a recap of where we were last week to set up the stage for today. Um, but then, yeah, like Don said, um, I won't I won't go for more than more than half the time because uh, we want to create some space for discussion and. Q&A and some follow-up um, in order to try to serve uh, serve each of you as, as well as possible. So let me share my screen here to kind of start our recap. Um, <clears throat> the, the theme last week was kind of around what we called everyday discipleship. Um, and so what does discipleship look like, not just on Sunday? Uh, many of us have, have had to ask that question over the last 18 months. And <clears throat> for folks who still aren't either comfortable or willing to, to show up in some, into some of our normal discipleship environments. Sometimes we're still having to ask that question. And so we just themed it around everyday discipleship. And we started just for context by defining a disciple. And again, this is a, a definition of a disciple. There's, there's nuanced versions of this, but um, define a disciple as one who increasingly knows and loves and obeys Jesus by the power of the spirit. Um, from there, we, we discussed kind of the everyday nature of discipleship and talked about how it is, yes, knowing and loving and obeying. And if that's the case, then ours as church leaders is to equip head, heart, and hands. And we talked some about adult learning versus childhood learning. It's not knowledge repetition, um, but adults learn best by learning something and then doing it and owning it. Uh, the more we do it, the more we get our hands dirty um, and experience things, the more we own it. And so this is kind of a summary of last week. Um, if that's true, uh, the disciples are, are uh, knowing, loving, and obeying uh, Jesus, then our discipleship must involve opportunities to know, do, and own various aspects of ministry and mission. Because by knowing, doing, and owning, we are shaping people's heads, hearts, and hands so that they can know and love and obey Jesus. So far too quick. You can see the recording for last week, but that's at least a little bit of, of where we went for those who weren't here. Um, 
And, and, and if that's true, then, then we said discipleship uh, must not just go beyond head knowledge. It must also go beyond Sundays. And so that's where we were talking about everyday discipleship last week. I have a good friend who, uh, who very much values the, the place of Sunday gatherings and teaching the scriptures as, as we all do. Um, but I think he rightfully claimed once that we, we must teach, but we also have to be honest about what teaching can accomplish. Um, and in his view, and again, this is nuanced, but teaching on a Sunday can inform people and inspire people. But a lot of the rest of equipping, the hands-on stuff, the, the, the entrusting discipleship to the disciples, that's, that's a lot of Monday through Saturday work. Um, and so that's where we were last week. Everyday discipleship, where we are this week, is kind of the fleshing out of that, uh, which we're calling discipleship in community, because it's in that Monday through Saturday space that a lot of just everyday Christians are together and, and community happens. So um, that's where we're going today is, is discipleship in community. And we said last week, uh, there's several New Testament references that, that we can draw a discipleship out of, to draw equipping out of, draw community out of, but we're basing both of these weeks in Ephesians 4. And so I'm going to read from Ephesians 4, starting in verse 11, which we also read last week. But here's what the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 4. Um, he gave, God gave, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we attain, until we all attain, the togetherness there, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be like children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine or carried about by human cunning or carried about by craftiness and deceitful schemes. But rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. For from Christ, the whole body is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. And when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Here's what I want to draw out today. <clears throat> every community, large, small, every church, every local church, however you want to think about it, every community is variously gifted and brings various perspectives. And that is a form of discipleship, as God's goal is for all of those perspectives to come together for the mutual upbuilding of one another. That's discipleship and community. So I'm just going to pray real quick that the Spirit would guide us, and then we'll dive into some of that. So um, God, would you give us a gift today of your leading, and would you inform our minds, yes, and also our hearts, and our, even our actions, God, would you um, help us to know you more, uh, think about how this can apply to our own communities, and our own churches. Um, be our teacher. It's in your son's name. Amen. All right, so again, every community has various gifts and various perspectives, and that reality of discipleship is God's goal as all of those perspectives come together in unity so that we can all be built up. So, so first, I want to think of these different gifts. Um, again, in context, if you, if you missed last week, Paul says in Ephesians 4 that God gives the church, God's people, God's covenant community, he gives the church two gifts. The first, verse 6, is he gives us the gift of grace through Christ. And the second, here, he gives us the gift of variously gifted people for one purpose, and that purpose is the building up of the body, the, the, the biblical version of maturity. And, and so perhaps these verses, especially verse 11, um, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, perhaps that's a familiar concept for you. It's a verse, frankly, we talk a lot about in, in my own local church, because um, we try to draw out and help people discover and thrive in their gifts. But there's often a huge misunderstanding when it comes to that verse. Um, I don't know about you, but, but for most of my church experience, I'd always heard that verse and those gifts referenced kind of exclusively limited to church leadership. But as we read that, there's, there's not a limitation to church leadership in those verses. In fact, if you look at all of 
uh, chapter four of Ephesians, really a, a lot of Ephesians is, is God's church. There is a few references. There are a few references to leadership, but it's not related to these verses. These verses are talking about the entirety of the body. God gives to his church unity. God gives to his church the grace of Jesus. God's give, God gives to his entire church different gifts. We see this in other passages and other books that Paul wrote of, of the entire church being different parts of one body. It's not limited to just leaders. And so it's everyday followers of Jesus that God equips with different giftings, here summarized as apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teachers. Other places summarized as gifts of administration, gifts of teaching, gifts of all these other things, service and generosity, and this kind of stuff. And so part of discipleship and community is helping people know their gifts and value each other's gifts. And, and if you're new to these terms, I'll take a moment and just dis describe them uh, for, for the sake of <clears throat> leveling the playing field. But, but again, as one, as one of, of a few different li lists of giftings in the New Testament, uh, the more apostolic gifting is someone who's more bent towards sending um, apostles in, in the proper capital A sense, and then lower A, the more apostolically gifted still today, are those who would go into new territory to start and sustain new works. Um, apostles were those who cultivated new communities. And so we think of maybe church planters today or those who are leading out in, in different ways and different creative forms of ministry for the sake of the kingdom. Uh, the prophetically gifted uh, are, 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 are into obedience. We should all be into obedience, but especially the, the prophets are really good at calling the church to to hear from God and then challenge us to obey. Um, prophets are often justice oriented, action oriented. Um, God says that, why aren't we doing this, is the, is the mantra of a prophet. Um, evangelists are gatherers. Those who are, who are more evangelistic go out into the culture and proclaim the good news to people, um, but they don't just go out and proclaim. They often bring people into the kingdom cause. And so evangelists are used to, to, to bring people into the kingdom and into the church. Um, shepherding, perhaps is one, these last two are a little bit more familiar to, to many in church leadership, but shepherding giftings are those who, who, are, who are good pastors, whether capital P titled pastors, they have a role staff, or um, whether they're just good pastoral women or men uh, among our communities. Um, pastors care, they, they nurture the body, they nurture the flock. And then uh, teachers, the gift of teaching is, is about truth connecting scripture to everyday life, explaining doctrine. Um, and again, these are only five of many giftings. And, and these are, are, are a couple of different ways to, to explain what these giftings are. But, but I wanna share that and I'll stop start sharing my screen for a few minutes here. Um, I, I wanna share that and even kind of define what some of those giftings are. And by all means, if you define one of those in a little bit of a different way, that's fine. That's not really the point of today. The point is that if God gives gifts to his church, then every community is full of women and men, both, quote, lay people and, quote, paid staff who are gifted in different ways like these and, and in many other ways, too. And if that's true, then everyone has a role to play in mission, in ministry, and in each other's discipleship. Is that fair? Everyone is gifted in some way. Everyone is, I'll say it another way, no one is gifted in every way. And so we all have a place to play in each other's discipleship. The problem though, and we see this, I know you've seen this in your churches, is that people really like people who think or act the same way we do. And so often, even if unintentionally, Within our churches, we find some people who are gifted in some ways devaluing other people's giftings or thinking, well, you don't think like I do. You're too inward focused. We just got to be on mission. Anybody ever heard that? Um, why is our church never on mission? Or on the other side of the thing, um, why, why, why don't we care for each other well? Um, all we do is ever talk about mission. And so we can end up hearing these comments across our church um, seeming like people devalue each other's giftings which is frankly something we're seeing in every other realm of society right now as well. Think like I do, you don't act like I do, I might as well cut you off. The beauty of the church's countercultural reality is that we get to come together and be unified in our different giftings 
rather than the all too common reality of people who split over their different perspectives or over their different giftings. Um, the, the picture of gifts working together in, in my mind is always one of a few different people kind of in a battle. You've seen this in Braveheart, you see this in Star Wars, you've seen it in any movie that has a battle in it. Um, it's this people like three or four of them just fighting shoulder to shoulder against a common enemy. And one of them is really good with a bow and one of them's really good with a, um, well, now, now the Ninja Turtles are coming to mind. One's really good with nunchucks. Um, and, and so they're all fighting shoulder to shoulder against a common enemy. That's a beautiful picture of variously gifted members of one body working together for a cause. What's dangerous, though, is when we stop fighting the common enemy and start saying, hey, I value my gifting. I don't really value your gifting. And so instead of fighting outwardly or having each other's back, we start to turn our punches and our blows toward each other. And so part of everyday discipleship for us who are leading in various ways, part of everyday discipleship is helping people discover their own gifts and helping them thrive in whatever gifts that they have, while at the same time helping equip people to realize the necessity they have for others' gifts. And, and, and to realize that they cannot be everything that God calls them to be by themselves. And that's the heart of discipleship in community. This is really reflecting one of the hardest phrases to utter in our culture today, which is to say, I have a need. You see this in your churches. We feel this in our lives. One of the hardest things to say is, I need someone or something else. I can't produce everything that I should produce. I can't be everything by myself. That's really really hard. We feel embarrassed. We feel ashamed because our culture says, no, you should be everything. You should be able to do everything by yourself. But that is the exact rally cry of the New Testament church. Again, First Corinthians, there's one body with many parts. The, the, the I, I need something is, is the rally cry of the gospel. Um, I, I can't save myself. I can't get to that. I need Jesus by the power of his spirit. To say I need is the heart of our cry as followers of Jesus. Paul warns Christians in, in 1 Corinthians 12 and, and Romans 12 against rejecting and undervaluing other people's gifts. And we see in our dependence on people a great reminder of our dependence on Jesus. Our need for help reminds us of our need for God. It's humbling, but it's right to see ourselves with that level of humility. Those are, those are some ways that the fellowship helps us be with Jesus. So shameless plug, Don was very kind to, to mention the book that I wrote, but that's, that's a lot of why uh, Moody published this, this book, is, is to try to help people discover the gifts that they have and the roles that they play in each other's life. Um, the, the subtitle of the book is How Do We Move from Facade to Family? And, and one reality that I try to draw out in the book and this is referencing kind of Acts chapter two, where we see the first glimpse of history's first church. Um, the kind of community we're talking about, where there's mutually giving and mutually receiving people, um, that kind of community is the community that God intended his church to be. But when we read places like Acts two, it seems just so foreign to us. Although I, I think, frankly, MB churches do better at this than, than some other veins of the church. But, but in Acts 2, God's people are actually using what God actually gave them to actually meet people's actual needs. And that's financial, but it's also spiritual and it's also tangible. And, and they're not doing it just for a tax write-off. They, they are personally, joyfully, sacrificially, holistically meeting each other's needs, meeting each other where they're at, providing what others don't have with glad and generous hearts. And part of my prayer is that God would do this in our churches, that, that, that we would be able to display God's care for us by devoting ourselves and leading our churches to devote themselves to this kind of holistic care for others. So I'll share my screen again, again, there are these many gifts but it's these many gifts existing within our churches. Yes, absolutely. Our, our leaders are wise to surround ourselves with folks who are unlike us. If we're really good shepherds, maybe we need someone more apostolic, more outward facing. If we're really good 
prophets just hear this. Why are we not doing it? Maybe we need some good shepherds to help us round out our edges. Um, that's true of leaders, but it's also true within the everyday followers of Jesus within our churches. It's the first reality of discipleship in community. It's not just our leaders, but it's every Christian gifted some way, differently than others, but all of us are incomplete by ourselves. We all need one another. So that drives us to discipleship in community. The second reality, though, is that the reason we're all gifted differently is one purpose. Apostles lead out in their giftings, apostolically gifted people, I'll say lead out in their giftings, shepherding gifted people lead out in their giftings, but there's one purpose that Paul tells us in the following verse, and that's the building up of the body of Christ. All of these things come together. All of us come together with our gifts. Let's even expand it beyond spiritual gifts. All of us come together with our different perspectives, our experiences, our passions to help each other grow up into Christ who's the head. That's biblical maturity. But even this concept of, ma of maturity, I think, gets missed, if not by us as leaders, then, then at least often by many people within our churches. And so I want to give you a little bit of a revamped view of how the Bible defines Christian maturity, because it's hardly ever mentioned. Um, here's the foundation of it. It's, it's in these same verses. Um, we, Paul talks about growing up in every way into Christ who's the head. And that in every way part gets skipped a lot. And we often just think of maturity as like, oh, we're just kind of growing up. Uh, we're, we're getting more knowledge. We're, we're doing better. But the in every way is a really important piece, especially in context of Paul saying, there's some who are gifted in this way. There's some who are gifted in that way. There's some who are gifted in other ways. So the, the body matures as we grow up in all of those ways into Christ who's the head. There's some ways, in other words, that you are stronger than myself. And if we were part of a church community, I would need your giftings to balance out and help me grow in my weaknesses. At the same time, I'm strong in some ways that you're not. And so God would put us together in order to help you grow in your weaknesses. We need each other's strengths to help us grow up in every way. To say it another way, this is, this is maybe, a, this is probably oversimplified, but just work with me on it. Um, this is kind of a common view of a Christian of a mature Christian. Like we, we, we kind of define someone's maturity as if we would age. She's, she's young. He's middle-aged. We say like, oh, he's, he's new in his faith or she's really mature. Um, as if it's just this one across the board over time, we're growing up all together. And, and some of you who are wiser saints, I won't say older, but some of you who are wiser saints, you feel a lot of pressure from this view to say like, oh man, I'm, I'm in my, 60s, I'm in my 70s, and, and people look to me like I have to have everything together. And, and on some level, it puts us in this world of having to having to pretend like we have it all together. That's that's not God's design for for maturity. Um, others, there's some there's some young bucks that you may know who are like, man, he's really gifted in this area. She is amazingly gifted in this other area. And so it kind of breaks down this over time, all of maturity happening together. I think what the Bible describes much more commonly, and again, this is really kind of a, a silly, nerdy way to think about this, but saying like, hey, someone's gifted in teaching, but they're not that gifted in shepherding. As we come together to help everyone grow up in every way, maybe because the good teacher spends more time, not the good teacher, that's Jesus, but maybe as someone who is gifted at teaching spends more time with someone who's good at shepherding, they grow up a little bit in that way over time. Maybe someone's faith grows up by spending time and energy and decades maybe with someone who has stronger faith than they do. And maybe that person who has strong faith gets to grow up in humility by spending time with the other person. This image of someone being gifted in administration or someone being gifted in faith, or someone being gifted in teaching, or someone being gifted in evangelism, is to say, I have some gifts, I have some strengths, praise God. I do not have all the strengths. And so I need your strength to come in and balance out my areas of weakness. 
that's how I would grow up in every way into Christ who's the head. You have some strengths, you have some giftings, praise God. You need others areas of strength to come in and balance out your weakness. And this is true for every woman and man and child. It's true no matter the staff role, no matter the title, no matter what it is. This is how we grow up in every way into Christ who's the head. That's a more biblical picture of maturity than just, well, the longer, the longer you walk with Christ, somehow it just automatically cranks you up into higher and higher percentage points. And that view of biblical maturity is kind of the, the foundation for the last point that I want to make today before we have some discussion. But based on that multiple gifting in every way definition of maturity, what the rest of these verses show is three things. Maturity in Christ is more than just knowledge. Paul talks about not being blown about by every wind of doctrine. Again, we talked about this last week. I'm not going to spend much time here because this deals with adult learning um, where we spent time last week. But discipleship is more than just head knowledge. Um, it, it's, it's, we've got to provide everyday opportunities for folks to go beyond that or else we're going to be blown around every time there's a new doctrine. Or we're going to think that just because we read a little bit more of our Bibles, we're going to be more mature. Absolutely, knowledge is important but it's got to be more than that. Maturing in Christ is also more than our ability. Paul talks against human cunning. Every wind of doctrine, human cunning, craftiness, and deceitful schemes are the things he kind of breaks down. And, and cunning gets a bad rap in our uh, language today. Cunning, cunning was not inherently a, a negative word like it is today. Today, we think of like evil queens from Disney movies and this kind of stuff being cunning. Cunning was just an ability to figure things out. Um, in the same way that uh, shrewdness is used both of in some of Jesus's teachings, but also is used of Satan, shrewdness can be a good thing. It's wisdom applied to a specific situation. Similarly, cunning is an ability to figure things out. But if our maturity is based on, I'll, I'll, I'll be personal about it, if my maturity in Christ is based on my ability to figure things out, then I'm resting it on something that is going to be false and fading. I mean, Isaiah and other places talk about how deceitful our own hearts are. Maybe we've, we've thought of, you can think of different <clears throat> rules that you made um, in order to try to put parameters around, you know, stopping sin or this kind of stuff and how quickly our hearts are to find ways around those rules or just to break right through the walls that we set up or this kind of stuff. Discipleship's not not about obedience and ability, but it's got to be about more than that. And it's got to be about more than methods. So craftiness and deceitful schemes. Uh, if cunning is kind of a neutral word, craftiness and deceitful schemes, those are inherently negative words. Um, it's things like, here's five steps that guarantee you to do this. Um, Self-help type books or teaching or this kind of stuff. They're tricky. They're deceitful because they feel like they work. But craftiness and deceitful schemes are, are some of how the enemy in Genesis 3 lured Adam and Eve away from, Satan, or from, uh, from, from God and holiness. Just do this. Does, does God really say this? Why don't you try this other thing? And so biblical maturity is more than knowledge. It's more than ability. And it's more than our methods. Rather, Paul says, continuing the same thought in verse 16, Ephesians 4 tells us that maturity in Christ requires one another speaking the truth in love. So there is knowledge. There is obedience. There is walking together. And yet, how do we grow up in every way into Christ who's the head? Verse 15 or 16 says it's by speaking the truth in love that we all grow up. What is this truth? It's not just throwing Bible verses at me when I sin. Here's a, here's a verse on this. You shouldn't, you, sh you shouldn't do that anymore. See, Jesus says this. That's, that's not truth in love. Truth in love is helping each other see how Jesus is good news and better than the specific situation I'm in. How Jesus is the answer to the question I'm asking. How Jesus meets me in the issue that I'm facing. Down in verse 21, we're told that the truth is the gospel. And we who are in church leadership know 
that it is hard sometimes to see in our own lives how the gospel is good news. How does Jesus actually meet this in our situation? If we're left to our own devices, if we're left to our own knowledge, our own ability, our own kind of uh, methods, this kind of stuff, if, if, if my faith is just mine, I'm going to be limited because I have blind spots. And there's areas of my life that, man, I'm really good at helping other people see how Jesus is good news in their situations, but I'm really bad sometimes in my own life. Not necessarily in knowing it, but at least in believing it. We're limited to one perspective, one point of view, if we're trying to walk out this faith alone. And so discipleship in community means taking ownership for each other's growth, caring for each other's well-being, bringing our gifts to the table and saying, I need your gifts to balance out my weaknesses, helping others admit that they need our gifts to balance out their weaknesses. And knowing each other well enough to be able to speak the truth and love from our different perspectives into each other's different situations. There's a, a friend of mine who runs a, a church in Atlanta. His name is Dahadi Lewis. And he one of their church values is that they take sibling-like responsibility for one another. And I just don't know a better way to capture discipleship in community than that phrase. They take sibling-like responsibility for one another. So biblical maturity involves speaking the truth, which is the gospel in love from our different giftings and different perspectives into each other's different situations. And another way to say that is to say that discipleship in community involves speaking the truth, which is the gospel in love from our different giftings and perspectives into each other's situations. None of us is perfect. None of us is complete on our own. We are each a valuable part of the body. For those of us in leadership, that's part of our role is to help people see they are a valuable part of the body. But each of us is also just one part. Of it. Discipleship in community is at its best when the whole church, the whole community humbles ourselves and acknowledges our need for one another. That's how we each grow up in the ways that we're not strong. It's only then that all of us will become more mature we'll look more like Christ, we'll thrive in our gifts and rest in the grace of God as we're more and more equipped one from another to pursue mission and ministry together. And that's where I'll stop. So we can have some conversation around some of this. Thoughts, questions? Tim, you asked a first one. Should we aim for slow and steady growth or fast or furious growth? Tim, I'm curious how you would respond to your own question. What do you think? Well, um, from my experience, uh, normally slow and steady growth is is more long term. Mm -hmm. But you know, I have heard stories of fast and furious growth that has been productive and, yeah. and long term as well. So I was just curious what what your thoughts were on. Um, you know, because I think it's important for us to, to, to set our own expectations as we're mm -hmm. trying to lead people through changes. I mean, if, if we're expecting everything to be different tomorrow, so. Yeah, yeah. I think the way you said that is really wise of saying like, you know, I've seen this for the most part, but there's situations where the other is true. And I think that all of us can think of moments in our own lives where it seems like growth in a certain area, at least, is like really, really quick or where like God helps a light bulb come on and, and, and this kind of stuff. And yet we can all probably also realize that the, <clears throat> the more typical reality is, is slow and steady. Um, so I mean, many of you are in, in, in or close to agricultural kind of uh, areas. I grew up on a farm. Um, and, and so I, I think we, I saw some of both of this, honestly. I think the expectation for us, for our people should be slow and steady. The, the New Testament talks a lot about being slow and laying on of hands. When we think of leaders uh, being transformed from one degree of glory to the next, that sounds sounds really beautiful. But but one degree at a time, you know, think of a circle. It's a, it's a lot of degrees over over a lot of time, probably. And so I think if our expectation is largely, hey, ours is to to, to till up the fields, to try to plant seeds, to expect slow growth. Um, then as spiritual farmers, uh, trusting God for the harvest, all of a sudden we wake up one day and sometimes it's like, whoa, there's, there's 
blossoms out there that we didn't expect. And there's a, a whole crop uh, that, that, that happened much more quickly. Um, and then we get to celebrate the fruit that God produced um, from our humble efforts. And so I think, I think what you said about expectations is probably really wise of going, I think our, our expectations should probably be slow and steady. Um, we've all tried to move too quickly and we know like the, the microwave is just never as good as the slow cooker. Right. Um, uh, yeah, there you go. Um, folks who love coffee would say the same thing that the, the Keurig K cups, not nearly as good as the pour over. I mean, just like the, the, the principle is true a lot of times. And yet there's times we just got to get a K cup and go. Um, and so, um, expecting the slow and steady, I think is wise because that is where we're, most of true growth happens and then if God chooses to bless the efforts and produce fruit beyond what we expect then we get to celebrate moments of quickness thanks yeah it's a good question quick coffee is bad all right well if you get nothing else out of the webinar then Dan took away that takeaway quick coffee is bad what um, else you have questions yeah go ahead Jason um, this is Jason in uh, northern Minnesota uh, up here, we're pretty bland when it comes to diversity, um, and we're very rural. And so, in, and I've thought of this before too. When you're looking at the, you know, kind of universal church, which is more what you're talking, you know, how does it work when you got a small community? We're all kind of alike, um, and yet you know you need these other people. I mean, I look at all the people joining and stuff in the different, you know, even here we're limited. You know, maybe in different gifts does every church have every gift or my little church is, you know, you kind of need, you know, two, three people to do everything, whether you're good or bad at it. And so you yeah. kind of just operate, you know, just basically a, a small rural church versus a mega church, maybe like 40 people versus 400. And just yeah. how does that work in, in this whole concept? That's a, that's a great question. Um, that's one of the beautiful parts of being part of a broader MB family. Um, and again, I don't, I don't know the inner workings of, of the denomination. I've gotten to serve in various places and I've done well. Um, but I do know that, that whether it's communities in one church or churches within a broad, like local churches within a broader church, one of the ways to answer the question is to say, let's use evangelism as a case study. If you don't know that, that someone's really gifted in evangelism in your, um, in your local church community, Jason, then is there someone in another church nearby or in another state that is gifted in that as part of a broader, and maybe, maybe it's outside of the MB family, maybe it's somebody else in another church in your city that you have a good relationship. There is the universal body of Christ giftedness that, that is balanced out, that can balance out some of the, the local church's giftedness. Um, and so is there someone who could help that is gifted in an area you'd love to see your church grow come in and, and train and, and help do some of that equipping i think that's one side of how i'd answer the other side of how i'd answer is um i i do think and i don't know your church this is a knock on you or your church or any church but but in my i've gotten to work with more churches that i probably deserve to to have gotten to work with um in many of them there are gifts that people have, but because they're not kind of the common gifts that they see or gifts that are celebrated, um, those gifts are kind of lying dormant um, or kind of lying, you know, under the frost kind of thing. And, um, and, and the majority of churches, again, yours, mine, all of them, people see the teacher on the stage and assume like that's what maturity is if I can know my Bible and tell it to others. Um, and, and praise God, that is one form of maturity. That is some of maturity. But from more behind the scenes folks or folks who are really gifted at faith or serving or prayer, um, like there's, there's, it's harder sometimes to see other giftings. And so I'd, I'd be, I'd be surprised if there weren't a few more gifts in existence in your church that just because they don't see, because people don't see them um, expressed as often or celebrated as often, they might not know that that's even a gift to be used for the upbuilding of the body. Um, so maybe maybe some tension between those two or some balance of those two could be a helpful piece to think through. Does that help at all? Yeah, that's good. Um, another thing I, you know, just in dealing with churches, we do get kind of in this church culture a lot of times, I think. And, you know, I, I just challenged, um, I am not a pastor. I'm just, uh, uh, I work as a, a nurse and I'm just, 
a lay person or whatever, but uh, working together, just the idea of discipleship, you know, mm -hmm. what is the end goal? You know, a lot of times I think we get focused on getting them there Sunday morning so then somebody can take over and they can hear from the pastor and right. they're done with them, you know, or whatever kind of thing. And going at building our local church versus building God's church. And I mean, that's more of taking people from not knowing Christ to knowing Christ kind of discipleship instead of taking them all the way to more spiritual maturity. But one of the challenges I said, get to know people, you know, get to know people you like and God brings you together. Have them over your home at least three times before yeah. you even invite them to church, you know, and then church would be more like, hey, this is something I do, but it, it becomes a little bit different kind of maybe discipleship, but uh, yeah. but I think just kind of the end result too, and being able to open up, we have had other churches in our area where you try to work together, and then it kind of gets, well, conflict of interest, because, okay, we're ministering to other people, now who churches are they going to attend, you know, right. whose fellowship are we going to build, and that's where it gets, you know, denomination versus denomination, Right. Anyway. Yeah. And that's probably not what we're going to be able to solve today, but <laughs> you know, there's a, a, a real tension to what you're saying. And, and if the territorialism wins, then uh, God's kingdom loses. Um, and, and that is a real thing, not just in your scenario, but, but in most of our cities, most of our places. Um, I think related to that, uh, Dan, Dan just asked a question, what are some entry points in implementing some of this within a church? Um, to, to build off of what Jason and I were just talking about, I think that helping people realize that there's a lot of different giftings and helping them discover theirs um, is, is a really helpful starting point. Because um, like Jason just said, and again, this is not unique we all know this in some ways like for many people they see their role in the church is coming and maybe sometimes trying to get somebody else to come um and that's probably understated some people serve and this kind of stuff but but by and large um what is their role in giving themselves to the rest of the body and we talked last week about like hey great starting point is someone to, to serve as an usher or hold the door this kind of stuff but what about each other's discipleship how can we help each other own responsibility like siblings um and so i think that that helping people thrive um in their giftings is a really good first step and some of this is us paying attention um just i'll, I'll stay on the evangelism uh case study because that's often one that we feel like is missing in our churches um uh, but but for the evangelist who is the person who is always talking about their favorite sports team or who is the the, the person who moves from selling essential oils to selling candles to and and somehow get with with no effort it seems like people to buy whatever they are selling Th those are really good evangelists they're just evangelizing candles or the packers um rather than evangelizing jesus and so helping people see hey this this thing that you do quote unquote naturally that that's that that can be used for the good of the kingdom same thing with shepherding who's who's always on you maybe for those of you who are church leaders who's always on you for going man we just got to care more for people great that person has a shepherding gifting um and rather than you having to feel the pressure to do everything they ask how can you equip them even if they don't have a title or a paycheck to to shepherd and so starting to notice people's giftings and then call them out and celebrate those is a, is a great starting point um and uh is, is there a tool recommended for discovering giftings um, I would say two things as uh, Tim's question over on the side. Uh, if there are a lot of like spiritual gifts inventories out there. Um, mo most of them are, are pretty adequate. Not everyone lists every single gift and you may define some of the giftings a little bit different. You know, word of knowledge is one that's de defined differently um, uh, in, in multiple different spiritual gifts tests. But there are some spiritual gifts kind of inventories out there. The, the danger, I think we mentioned this last week, the danger of anyone's self-assessment though, is that they are assessing themselves um, and we all have blind spots. And so very often we will assess ourselves based on the person we think we should be. Um, and so those can be some good tools. There's, there's a pest inventories, there's spiritual gifts inventories. Those can be helpful. Um, the best way to do that though, is to, to pair that with kind of a 360 degree view of who in their community sees them as being really good at something um, and celebrating the actual fruit that they see. Um, again, like I just said, you you evangelize to, to different things all the time. Like that, that's a that's a informal tool, but a tool in helping someone discover their giftings and just pointing out what you see or inviting their community to point out what 
community. So maybe a mix of those, um, the, the different inventories, self-assessments, and then also uh, everything in the Christian life happens better in community. So could gifts be discovered in community as well? Uh, the lesser known gifts that uh, I spoke of earlier, Mike, um, this largely depends on the on the situation. So if this I'm going to use two categories that are not inherently biblical to speak about gifts, but a lot of times they're like upfront gifts and then behind the scenes gifts. Um, and so faith is a gift, um, but it's really hard it, outside of relationship, at least to experience somebody else's gift of faith, whereas teaching is a gift. And people will look at, you know, a Sunday preacher and go like that, that, that person has the gift of teaching, obviously. And so different situations, different churches, um, largely, it depends on how the leadership of the church is wired, that those gifts are the ones that are just not intentionally valued more, but they're up front more, they're seen more, or they're experienced more by the rest of the body, whereas there's some gifts that are, that are just a little bit more lesser known or hidden or maybe less experienced publicly would be a way to say it. So, um, uh, I mean, again, depending on the, um, depending on the list of spiritual gifts, that kind of stuff, uh, depending on what your church does with prayer, that is either like a publicly celebrated get prayerfulness, publicly celebrated gift or more of a hidden gift, depending on your church's view of prophecy and its existence today, which we're not going to answer any more questions about. But um, what is the what what is the role of, of more, the more prophetic uh, side of teaching and, and equipping in the church and that kind of stuff? So I don't know how else to say it other than to say there's just some that are more present and more experienced in every church, and there's others that are a little bit less. Um, but I love how Paul even writes in First Corinthians 12 that the 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 gifts that are or the parts of the body that are more vulnerable or more private in some ways um, are, are even more valuable. And so there's something there for us in leadership to help draw out how do we, how do we help the gifts that are less seen or known become more seen and more known? Um, Dan asked another question of uh, how might you encourage those who maybe see themselves as growing up uh, as as much as they need to. How might you encourage those who maybe see themselves as grown up as much as they need to? Are you asking, Dan, unmute for me. Are you asking like, how do you help people who think they're grown up realize that they have need for others? Or am I missing your question? Uh, yeah, just as far as, you know, people who are like, hey, I've, I've grown or I'm mature enough. And, you know, I don't, I mean, how do you disciple people further that have kind of maybe see themselves as stalled out or or don't really care to grow more? Yeah. Um, I mean, if you had, there's, there's a version of that conversation, um, that I'm just going to be silly for a minute, uh, where you can say like, well, it seems like you have a lot of growth in humility then. Um, cause if you think you've kind of arrived, uh, then there's at least one area of faith that you just expressed to me that you're not being very mature. Uh, so there's a way loving way to have that conversation, uh, not a punk way. Like I just, uh, uh pretended to share. Um, but I think it is that reality, helping people shift from this maturity is an across the board. She is mature. He's not mature. They've been walking with Jesus for 20 years. So she is not as mature as she should be, or he is more mature than I would expect. Like, again, if we help people realize that maturity is not just this across the board label, but rather, I love that you are really mature in these areas i see you being mature in these areas and maybe asking them like but what's an area of your maybe phrasing it like this even what's an area of your faith that um that you feel like is lacking what's something that you struggle with if they don't have any then then again there's that humility piece there's that hey could could i walk alongside you could i share something with you that i see as as not being as developed in in this amazingly gifted person that you are you're not 100 percent mature because only jesus was mature um a hundred percent and if 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 you think you've made it <laughs> then then somehow uh you're you're missing an area of, of growth and need so i don't know dan if that's a helpful starting point but just helping them just helping them reframe a view of maturity from this one single definition to this growing up in every way piece and then inviting them by their volition or yours into areas that they might uh feel like they need help. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Okay. 
What else? Other thoughts, questions? And by all means, if anybody has a thought on something that on an answer that I've given, uh, this doesn't need to be like a just ask, ask, ask an expert because I'm not an expert. So uh, if you have other thoughts on some of these questions that are in the chat, I'd love to hear your experience because some of you are gifted in ways and have had some of these experiences that I haven't. So we can even practice what we're preaching today if you have a thought on something that somebody asked. And I'm, I'm going to press in a little bit more on the aspect of you know, how do you work this out in the church? It, it's it's not necessarily, I don't think, going to get worked out very well on Sunday morning, you know, Sunday morning worship service. Um, if there there isn't other ways to be able to use gifts, experience gifts, do the one on others, all of those things. So what are what what does a church need to have tangibly to be able to express the gifts within yeah. the body? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question, Don. I think that uh, marrying these two webinars together is is kind of answering part of that. Um, so today we talked about the in community piece. Some of it last week focused a little bit more on us as as church leaders, uh, both acknowledging that discipleship is more than just Sundays and then freeing and empowering people to carry out discipleship together. Um, and so that piece is absolutely vital if today's piece of seeing discipleship happen in community uh, will ever take shape. And so for some of us, it's being willing to give away responsibility, uh, which is really hard for some of it. It's, it's being willing to to give some of our duties over to someone that we could frankly do better than, than they could, but how else are they going to grow? Um, not only their gifting, but just in their experience. Um, and so some of it starts with us saying, Hey, will will we be able to take the identity hit? If I can be very personal about it for myself, can we take the identity hit that it is for someone to go to someone who's not me to ask a question or to receive something? Um, and so that's the first part is permission, giving, empowerment, equipping, whatever phrase you want to put in that, um, that slot. It starts with us as church leaders saying, yes, I, I want to see other people equipped for the work of mission and ministry. Um, and then the other side is to go, okay, what's the first step? Um, we talked about this with adult equipping last week. Uh, Mike, your, your question, did we send the articles on adult learning? We spoke of, we're going to send all the kind of slides and everything after today. So this relates to Dawn's question. Um, we talked about case studies or finding some ways to go like, hey, if you're going to, if, if you're gifted, as, if you're gifted as a shepherd and just need more experience, what are some, what are some scenarios that I as a church leader and you as someone who wants to grow in that or should grow in that can sit through together and be like, how would you counsel someone in this scenario? And, and give them kind of a few uh, experiences that are more hypothetical. And then last week we talked about and then bringing them into a real live counseling scenario. If that feels like it's too big of a jump for some of the people in our church, and it would be for some people in our church churches, um, the one and others are a really helpful place to start. Um, so so there's, there's lists, again, I can kind of just we can Google these. I don't have like the definitive list of one another's, but there's there's a few graphic representations. And if you Google just the one another commands, there's a hundred one another commands, love one another, serve one another, bear each other's burdens, laugh with each other, rejoice with each other, cry with each other. There's there's all these one another commands. Tolerate one another is my favorite because 90% of the time I can at least do that with folks uh, in my churches. Um, maybe just that sometimes bear with one another is the literal translation, but I like tolerate better for the sake of today. Um, but, but, but could you, could you give folks this list of one another commands and just ask them, could you do one of these? If they don't feel like they have anything to offer someone, um, then, then those are maybe the most like not low bars and like, doesn't matter, but low bars and like the first easy step is to have a bunch of one another commands with you or point them to uh, some of the one another commands and just be like, can you pick one and, and, and try to carry that one command out one time this week with one other person. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot of my, my training opportunities have been around, like, how do you change a church from being inward focused to outward focused? And as an example, we're talking about, um, if, if there's a if there's a, a Sunday school class or a group that has always met just facing forward while one person teaches, um, 
than, than the first time they circle up and start to share a little bit of what's going on in their lives. It seems like a very small act, but it's a disproportionately big move if they've never done it before. Um, in the same way, if they've never gone out and served together, and it's a desire of the church's leadership is that being more outward facing a, a, a class or a group would go serve together. I'm not saying you have to, just as an example, the first time they ever do that um, can seem like a small act, but if they've never done it before, it's a disproportionately large thing. And so in the same way, if someone's never realized that they have a place in bearing somebody else's burdens or in that they actually have a tangible way to meet somebody else's need, it can seem like a really small thing in the grand scope of things, but back to the like fast versus slow mindset, if that's one degree of transformation into to a little bit more glory, then it's a disproportionately large act for someone to say, I've never done this before, but I realize I have a place to play in somebody else's life. So case studies, actual equipping, and then one another commands, um, which are all, they're all discipleship related. They're all community related. Someone said last week, even just taking the fruits of the spirit, uh, you can't love nobody. You can't show kindness to nobody. And so, so much of the commands in the New Testament and the fruits of the spirit have to be carried out in the context of community. You can't bear one another's burdens alone. You can't serve somebody else if you're never interacting. So helping folks see just this one thing matters for somebody else's discipleship and for your own discipleship can be helpful. So do you think that's one of the dangers of the remnant of, of COVID of people that are now staying home and thinking they're experiencing the church, you know, by watching the worship service or whatever, but you know, they're, they're not really engaging. Um, um, you asked this uh, direct question, so I'll give you a direct answer. Yes, I, I do think that's a danger is that people are have the opportunity now uh, to define church by receiving somebody's teaching. Um, although I don't know that that hasn't been the case for a lot of years in many of our churches. It's just a little bit more overt because it's online. Um, many of us have lamented over the years, those of us in church leadership, that that there's folks who come up and come to our gatherings, sit there and receive a sermon. Perhaps they, you know, throw a couple bucks in an offering plate and think that pays for the service they just got uh, to, to very intentionally overstate it. Um, we've just seen that become more overt when they're not in the room. Um, and so the, a, a true church community involves that gifting, right? There is the teaching gift that's carried out on Sundays. Um, but it's not limited to that gifting. And a true church community is one that is being formed together, at least for the sake of our conversation today, it's, it's one that's being formed together into the, mature, into, the, into the image of Christ who is the head, is what Paul's talking about. And so it's hard to be formed together alone. Frankly, it's hard to be formed together when we were, we're feeling like we have to just put up an image or a front or a facade as well though. And so it is, what you're describing, Don, is, is the most overt picture of that, but it's not, our, our misunderstanding of church community is not limited to those who are at home alone on the screen. Um, it's equally felt by folks who feel like they have to have everything together in order to fit in. Yeah, I like that idea. Just kind of some comments. Um, just the idea that sleeping church um, and just people, whether they're online or, or in the pews, not being utilized. Um, also, just maybe a, maybe comment on just the different parables in the Bible, whether uh, I think it's Matthew 14 or Luke. Luke 19 or Matthew 25, 14 and on in Luke 19. Or just the idea of these, um, you know, some would say parable of the talents or the gold, you know, or Jesus, you know, and, and then, okay, the more you have, the more will be given kind of thing if that kind of works, you know, to maybe in these small churches, if I keep investing, maybe I will have all the gifts kind of thing, you know, just, just your thought on that. But also, um, you know, whenever I see the world and you walk around, you see the diversity, you know, I always think back to Genesis 127, how, you know, male and female, they're all created in the image of God and how few people I know in my connections and how few, how little I actually know God by knowing less people and seeing how huge God really is. If you think the image of God and if every person, and you think the limited people with who are in the small 
you know, local church walls versus the global church. And then the people who are out there, maybe um, like my um, niece is going to a Guns N' Roses concert in the Twin Cities or something this weekend. And you think of the voice of Axl Rose or these other talented musicians, you know, totally in a secular setting. But are those gifts, you know, created in the image of God? That person is created in the image of God. And just how gifted the church would be if everybody could realize um, that cool stuff. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. I'll be, I'll be super fascinated to answer knowing, knowing our time. Um, the short answer to your second question is yes. Like, like there are, there are, everybody's created in the image of God. So we each get to shine forth some of God's glory, whether we know it or not. And so to your point, like it'd be beautiful if all of us used our gifts for the purposes that they were given. And yet since Genesis three, that hasn't been the case. And so there's, there's a, a hope for redemption and restoration there that, that we would use our gifts for, for the right purposes. And yet, whether overtly like an Axel Rose or uh, all of us in other ways, in a more subtle ways, uh, use our gifts for other purposes as well. Um, and then to the parable of the talents, we, we talked about that a little bit last week. So I'll, I'll uh, just summarize it by saying, yeah, it does start with us being willing to give up some responsibility and just like the landowner did in Jesus's parable. And there's no guarantee that Jesus will then give us more. There's the, the danger of like the karma. If I do this, he will do this mindset. And yet um, God is a good father, wants his children to have good gifts. That's why he gave us the spirit. That's why he gives us gifts. And so similar to the wealthy landowner in the parable, um, it is not uncommon Though again, we can't just demand that Jesus do or God do it, but it is not uncommon that if we are faithful with much or faithful with little, then he will um, expand our territory to go all Jabez about it. So I will close with that and hunt back to Dawn. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Um, really appreciate the time that you provided for us. If you can give the applause, whatever, if you feel like doing that, <laughs> or use your little. Um, well, what are those called? Reaction button. Um, also, Janae, thank you for all the work that you did. And as Ben mentioned, uh, we will be sending out, uh, is it by request or are we doing it for everybody? Your PowerPoint and material? Yeah, just... I think we'll send it to everybody who was registered. Okay, yeah. Use that list. And then also on your book is that, am I correct in saying, there's a discount on that book if you were registered. Yes, and we'll figure out a more certain answer to that question. Okay. And that <laughs> when we send all the other resources as well. <laughs> yeah, that we'll, we'll figure out how, how we'll to figure do out. that. But, you know, really good stuff. So, and I'm honored. Ben, thank you. Um, real quick, just when I used the link, it, it did have a discount at Moody Publishers. So, there okay. you go. Right, we'll make sure you get the discount. Thanks, Tim. So, uh, Lord, we thank you for the time. We thank you for the ability to be able to think about discipleship, what it means to be a follower of you. We want to grow in that, Lord. We want to experience more as a body, collectively, as community. And so I pray that uh, there would be some things that each of us have gleaned from this time together to help us to do that as you build your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, bye all.